In the last lecture, we studied thin FO theory. Today, we're going to review it and also look at several problems of how to use thin FO theory to solve real-world problems on airfoils. So in thin FO theory, we first uh, do a change of variable. So we represent the x coordinate from the, uh, the leading edge at x equal to 0 to the trailing edge at, at, at x equal to c uh, with the length of the chord c times half of 1 minus cosine of theta. So that changes the variable x, the physical coordinate, to the angle theta coordinate. And uh, all the thin FO theory uh, formulas are represented in the changed variable theta. So uh, we first represent the shape of the chord, uh, shape of the camber of the airfoil in terms of theta. So the dz dx or the slope of the airfoil is represented as a constant term a naught plus a infinite series of going i goes from 1 to infinity of a i, the amplitude of that term, times a cosine of i theta. So this is a cosine series. And if the airfoil can be represented in terms of the amplitude, the summation of amplitude of a bunch of cosines, then we know the distribution of vorticity, gamma, as a function of x, can be represented also in terms of 2 times u infinity times alpha, the angle of attack, plus a0, the constant term in the slope. Right, so having a constant in the slope is the same as having an angle of attack times the angle of attack term, which is uh, uh, actually 1 plus cosine theta divided by sine theta. So this is a characteristic function that represents how the uh, so how the vorticity distribution and as a result how the pressure distribution changes as you change the angle of attack. And then plus a sine series, so same i goes from 1 to infinity of the same ai, the amplitudes, times a sine of i theta. Okay, and uh, uh, in the last lecture we explained that the vorticity distribution is going to affect the velocity distribution and the particularly the difference of velocity uh, between the upper surface and lower surface. And that in turn is going to affect the uh, difference between the pressure on the upper and lower side of the surface. So the delta P as a result is going to be 2 times rho u infinity squared times the same uh, terms in the parentheses. And uh, uh, we often are interested in the pressure coefficient, which is uh, uh, the pressure divided by half rho u infinity squared. So that gives us a factor of 4, right? Because I'm dividing by half of rho u infinity squared times the same coefficient. And all of this can be split into two terms. One term is only a function of alpha, right? If you look at alpha times 1 plus uh, cosine theta divided by sine theta, That's, uh, that term can be separated out as an influence of the angle of attack. And all the remaining uh, part does not depend on the angle of attack, but just to depend on the shape of the airfoil, right? So that's something we'll explore in the next uh, few slides. So here you can see a Desmos uh, book. You can click the link to actually play with it yourself. So uh, essentially, you can change these numbers, a0, a1, etc. Changing a0 would allow you to change the angle of attack, right? That actually is the characteristic term. That's a 1 plus cosine divided by sine. So uh, changing that to just to increase or decrease the magnitude of that function. And uh, a1, etc. and a2, uh, that's going to give you the different shape of the airfoil, as you can see from the uh, from the red line, right? So if you make a0 equal to 0, and uh, a1 equal to a positive number, and uh, a2 equal to 
uh, zero, you're gonna see a camber line that's a, a parabola that gives you a semicircular vorticity distribution and as a result, a semicircular a pressure difference between upper and lower surface. If you compound that with an angle of attack, you're gonna see the vorticity distribution is gonna add it with the same characteristic function as we have when a1 is equal to zero. Okay, so let's look at our first question. We have three different airfoils, all of them are symmetric. So a symmetric airfoil has zero camber. That means my A0, A1, A2, etc. are all going to be zero, right? The three different airfoils have three different thicknesses. And I plotted uh, the pressure distribution on the upper and lower surface of the three airfoils over here. The question is, I want you to identify which pressure distribution corresponds to which airfoil. All of them are at 5 degrees angle of attack. Okay, now let's get to the solution. So first of all, one of the pressure distribution has a very high peak, right? That corresponds to the infinite, infinite vorticity at the leading edge for exactly thin airfoils. So for finite thickness airfoils, you can observe that if the thinner the airfoil, the closer the gap between upper and lower pressure is to the uh, conclusion of the thin airfoil theory. So that peak, that spike over here, corresponds to the pressure distribution of the thinnest airfoil, right? And if you look at the CP plot, uh, on the upper side is the lower pressure, right? So which means that uh, this pressure distribution corresponds to the high peak and uh, goes uh, down over here, corresponds to the upper surface, the suction side, of the thinnest airfoil. And uh, uh, then the medium one up there corresponds to the suction side, the upper side of the medium thickness airfoil, and uh, the topmost one corresponds to the uh, upper side or the suction side of the thickest airfoil. Now this tells us what the three upper lines are about. How about the three lower lines? We know they all correspond to the pressure side or the lower side of the airfoils, but which one is which? Which one corresponds to the thinnest airfoil? Which one corresponds to the thickest airfoil? To answer this question, we have to note a particular result of the thin airfoil theory. That is, thin airfoil theory predicts the pressure difference between the upper and lower side, right? But does not predict the pressure itself. Well, actually, uh, there is an extension that predicts the pressure itself, but we haven't uh, looked at it yet, right? So we only uh, go from the camber and uh, predict the pressure difference. And all of these airfoils has the same camber or zero camber and at the same angle of attack, right? Five degrees. That means if the thin airfoil theory can be trusted, then the difference between the upper and lower pressure are actually the same among the three airfoils. Of course, this is not exactly true, but still approximately true for this case, right? So if you think about uh, the upper and lower surface pressure distribution difference, it's roughly the same across the three airfoils. Then uh, this one, the lower one on the upper surface, sh which we said uh, uh, corresponds to the thinnest airfoil, should correspond to the lowest one also on the suction side. If this one corresponds to the thin airfoil and uh, uh, this one also would correspond to the thin airfoil, right? If this one is the medium, this one corresponds to the medium. And if this one corresponds to the thick airfoil, this one would correspond to the thick airfoil. Alright, so that's the uh, answer to this problem. Next, let's look at how the angle of attack changes the distribution of velocity and pressure. So here, we look at the same airfoil, a Naka 006. So again, it's a symmetric airfoil, and uh, we plotted the pressure distribution at three different angles of attack. Right. From this plot, it's quite clear that uh, this uh, one corresponds to both upper and lower surface at zero degrees, 
and then this one corresponds to one degree on the upper surface, one degree on the lower surface, and uh, two degree on the upper surface, and uh, two degrees on the lower surface. Now the question is, how do you estimate the pressure distribution as well as the lift and moments at three degrees angle of attack? Well, remember that the difference between the upper and lower pressure, right, delta P, can be split into two terms, right? Uh, one term is actually just a function of alpha, right? That's actually two rho u infinity squared times uh, this function one plus cosine theta divided by sine theta times alpha, right? And the other term has a zero, a one, etc. Right? It also has a uh, of it has a zero times the same function plus a summation of a i sine i theta, right? So that's sine theta one plus cosine theta. Okay. So essentially, what uh, we observe is that as alpha increases, the delta p increases pretty much by the same function, right? This is a function of x. So as a result, the gap between adjacent angles of attack is the same at the same x location or the same theta location. As a result, you can basically sketch the three degree angle of attack as if you move this line up by another constant, which is the same as the gap between uh, the previous angles of attack. And the gap would increase as you go towards the leading edge, right? You get a, a higher spike near the leading edge and uh, you just follow the same gap as you go towards the trailing edge. Same on the pressure side, except for you always have a stagnation point of equal to one, right? So you follow the same gap and, oops. Yeah, you follow the same gap and go, that diminishes towards the trailing edge. And this gap is exactly uh, this function over here. Okay, now we finished uh, looking at symmetric airfoils. Let's get to some non-symmetric airfoils. Oh, also, uh, what is the lift and uh, moment coefficients, right? For lift coefficients, again, we know this is a constant increment, right? So basically, the lift coefficient is going to be an integral of this delta p from the leading edge to the trailing edge. So if the first term uh, is does not depend on uh, depends on alpha linearly then the lift coefficient also depends on alpha linearly right so at three degrees angle of attack you can basically extrapolate right if this is a point one one five this is point two three you're gonna get point uh, uh, three four five and the moment coefficient uh, we are going to look at uh, uh, later is that uh, the moment coefficient does not depend on the angle of attack, right? So this is because if you uh, look at the moment, if you integrate uh, the delta p, right, to get the moment, you have to integrate delta p times the moment r, which in this case is uh, quarter c minus x. So we are defining the moment around the quarter chord times dx. And uh, if you plug in this delta p without the a0, a1, etc., right, assuming symmetric airfoils. If you integrate this function multiplied with uh, quarter c minus x, you get uh, 0, right? If a0 equal to a1 equal to etc. equal to 0. All right, so the moment coefficient is going to be staying to be basically 0 uh, as you increase the angle of attack. Now, when we get to a non-symmetric airfoil, can we estimate the moment coefficient around the quarter chord? So here, the question is, I gave you the uh, distribution of pressure of that non-symmetric airfoil at three different angles of attack. Let's estimate the moment coefficient. Okay, I also give you the lift coefficient.
Okay, let's start. If you look at the uh, pressure distributions, we first need to identify which one corresponds to which, right? So let's figure out how does the upper and the lower pressure change as you increase the angle of attack. As you increase the angle of attack, on the upper side, we always have a decreasing pressure, and on the lower side, we always we, we always have an increasing pressure. So now the angle of attack is zero, one, and two, right? So by this logic, we know that this line is alpha equal to zero, as well as this uppermost line on the lower side, and uh, this line would be alpha equal to one, and alpha equal to one. And the uppermost line is alpha equal to 2, and the lowermost line here is alpha equal to 2, right? Okay, so on the three pairs of lines, the simplest function is the red one, the alpha equal to 0, right? And if you look at the gap, the gap between the upper and lower surface, which is really what contributes to lift, it looks like a... Uh, elliptical shape in the sense that uh, the maximum difference between the upper and lower side is over here and as you go towards the two sides the diminishing pressure difference is almost uh, symmetric right now if the delta p is symmetric what can we say about the moment that symmetric pressure difference creates in particular do we know which point would uh, this different pressure create a zero moment? Well, it's the half chord, right? So if the pressure is symmetric, that is, if delta P of x equal to delta P of half C minus x, right, then as we integrate from 0 to c, half c minus x times delta p x dx, we can actually uh, we can split the integral into two parts. One goes from zero, uh, 0 to half c, right over here. We get a uh, we get a negative contribution. Actually, we get a positive contribution. And the second part uh, from half c to c we have a negative contribution and the two would exactly cancel out because of this uh, uh, symmetric condition. So that goes to zero, okay? Now we know that the moment around the half chord equal to zero, the moment coefficient is always, uh, unless otherwise specified, defined at the quarter chord, is actually defined as the integral from zero to c a quarter c minus x times delta p x dx. So how can we go from the zero moment around the half chord to uh, the moment around the quarter chord? Well, we can manipulate the integral and uh, have a minus half c and then plus a half c, right, which cancels out inside the parentheses. Okay. So that integral is going to be split into two parts. One part is a quarter c minus half c times delta p dx. And the second part is half c minus x times delta p dx. And the second part, by what we have previously worked out, is zero, right? That means we only get the first part left. And the parentheses on the first part is a constant, minus c over 4, right? And then we get an integral from 0 to c delta p dx. And this integral is the lift. So what we get is minus a quarter c times the lift. Okay, so now we related the moment at the quarter chord of that alpha equal to 0 pressure distribution, right? to the lift. And we know the lift coefficient at alpha equal to 0 is 0.65. So how can we go from the lift uh, coefficient to the lift and as a result to the moment coefficient? 
all right the derivation is the follows so we know lift is equal to the lift coefficient right times half rho u infinity squared times the chord length okay and to go from the moment to the moment coefficient we need to divide the moment so is cm is equal to the moment around the quarter chord right divided by half rho u infinity squared times c squared and we see that uh, this dividing thing cancels with uh, uh, this and also the c right and as a result we get minus cl divided by 4 so approximating the difference between upper and lower side pressure as symmetric we know that the moment coefficient is about a quarter of the cl right at alpha equal to 0 right because alpha equal to 0 is the pressure difference that's actually symmetric between leading and trailing edge so that gives me about 0.16 Right, so let's see if that is correct. Uh, 0.159, that's pretty close, right? Okay, how about the moment coefficient at other angles of attack? Well, it's much more, it's much harder to estimate from the pressure distribution because the uh, pressure difference is no longer symmetric between leading and trailing edge. But we can use the thin FO theory and the particularly the gap between adjacent alphas, right? The gap between alpha equal to zero and the alpha equal to one. We know that the gap is proportional to this function one plus cosine theta over sine theta, right? Okay, and we also know that this function when we multiply with a quarter c minus x right which is a function of theta times dx also a function of theta if we integrate theta from 0 to pi which also integrates x from the leading edge to the trailing edge that gives us 0 right so as a result of that as i increase the angle of attack the increment on the moment coefficient should be zero according to thin FO theory and as a result the moment coefficient is roughly the same there is only a little bit of change because this airfoil is not infinitely thick right but this is actually a pretty good uh, uh, approximation that results from the thin FO theory Now let's take a look at how the thin FO theory applies to a particular class of airfoils, the Naka four-digit airfoil theory series. So the Naka four-digit airfoil has four numbers designating the shape of the airfoil. The first two numbers are related to the camber, and the last two numbers are related to the thickness. So the first two numbers, one uh, is the, let's say, as M is the maximum camber in percentage right so p is the location of the maximum camber in tenth of the chord right m is in percentage of the chord and the last two numbers tt is the thickness also in percentage of the chord so for example a naka 2412 or 2412 has 2% two camber uh, two percent times the chord length as camber or maximum camber at four tenths of the chord and with a thickness twelve percent of the chord and uh, there is a uh, Desmos book that gives you the shape of the airfoil as you tune these numbers, right? So this is 2 for 12. The green line shows you the shape of the airfoil. 
if you increase m right so this is uh, uh, Naka 9412 that has a, a 9% uh, the chord length as the max camber at uh, the max camber is at uh, uh, 4 tenths or 40% of the chord so changing P is going to shift uh, the location of the maximum camber either upstream or downstream Okay, T represents the thickness or the maximum thickness of the airfoil. So 12 means the maximum thickness is 12% of the chord. Increasing T makes a thicker airfoil and the decreasing uh, T makes a thinner and thinner airfoil. Okay, so now of course the thin airfoil theory only respo responds to the camber. So changing T doesn't really change how the uh, vorticity distribution is, right? So uh, here, let's actually uh, take a look at how the camber changes the uh, the terms in the thin airfoil theory. That's uh, the A's, right? The A1, A2, etc. So here uh, we see that uh, let's first uh, make the angle of attack equal to zero. Okay, and we see a Naka 9412 airfoil or with a maximum camber at the mid chord gives us and a0 equal to 0, a1 equal to a positive number, and a2 is equal to exactly 0, a3 is also going to be 0, a4 equal to 0, etc. So, and max camber at the mid chord gives us only a non zero a1, and as a result, the vorticity distribution is exactly semi circular or semi elliptical. So, now if we shift the max camber location to upstream, right? So let's say a uh, uh, 9412 airfoil. Then what we do, actually, let's actually make it uh, uh, make it uh, 5412. Okay. We are going to see that my A0 is no longer 0 anymore. And that actually have a leading edge that has a, a result in the leading edge vorticity distribution. That's actually minus infinity. Of course, you can adjust uh, the angle of attack to make it slightly positive to actually shift it to, uh, yeah, to, to make the leading edge uh, has no infinite suction. And uh, we also see that uh, uh, shifting the max camber towards the leading edge gives us a non-zero A2. And as a result, the maximum pressure difference between upper and lower side also shifts upstream, right? That actually reduces how much uh, moment you have around the quarter chord. So shifting P, shifting the max uh, camber even more upstream, uh, actually shifts the uh, pressure maximum pressure difference even more upstream and uh, uh, further reduces how much moment you have around the quarter chord. 